Welcome to another ABC Radio National podcast. For more information, go to abc.net.au slash rn. And welcome to All in the Mind on ABC Radio National. Natasha Mitchell with you. Great to have your ears. And radio is, of course, the great festival of the ear. But a question for you. If your sight was taken from you, what would you most miss seeing? Of course, sunsets, sunrises, the mountains, the sea. So much beauty, so much beauty, Natasha, honestly. And most people are completely blasé, you know, they, they really walk past miracles daily. I think I would, I would truly, truly appreciate the wonderful world that surrounds me and us and uh, just life and the world and the universe is a totally wondrous thing. One might wonder, how would a brain that has never received visual information, how might it imagine a scene, the spatial layout uh, of a scene? Or how might a blind person dream? Do their dreams have any what we would consider visual content? Peering into what is the subjective experience of a blind person? How is it that a blind person experiences the world? Or if you ask them to imagine being in a room, Exactly what is it that they're imagining? Uh, I would love to find out. Today on the show, Blindness and the Mind, the first of two programs exploring how the blind brain sees and senses the world. This week, challenging the dogma about how malleable or plastic the contents of our skull really are. In 1951, Zoltan Tori was just 21. He'd escaped the Soviet occupation in Hungary, arrived in Australia alone and was studying dentistry at university. But a shocking industrial accident robbed him of his eyes, an exploding vat of acid blinding him permanently and fusing his vocal cords. His life since has been channelled into two quite extraordinary books, a memoir called Out of Darkness and another, The Crucible of Consciousness, which is recognised as a robust and unique contribution to the study of the conscious mind, so much so it's about to be reissued by MIT Press. What do you remember of that last experience of what you formerly knew as sight, as vision. Well, Natasha, I remember absolutely everything. In fact, uh, over the years, my memory is only sharpened. Evidently, the visual cortex, far from going blank and uh, atrophying, it has picked up in acuity, and uh, it is now totally under my command, so I virtually live in a visual space that I constantly produce myself. It is not really a canvas that I'm looking at, it is really visual space so that I'm in the middle of which I find myself. So if I turn around, for example, I see what was behind me and as I turn my head around in the room where I am, so I orient into the objects and furniture which I'm facing at and it's a completely technicolor textured visual world which apparently I continuously produce. Zoltan Tori's experience of an inner eye. Phenomenal. More in a moment. A huge proportion of your brain, around a third, is dedicated to vision. Perhaps not surprising given how much of what we think and do is mediated by what we see. The whole back section of your brain containing what's called your visual cortex is involved. But what happens when you're born blind? Does this part of your brain then sit idle, twiddling its neuronal thumbs? Or is it co-opted in unexpected ways? Joining me from the studios of Harvard University are two guests... First, meet Pawan Sinha, a computational neuroscientist with a difference, associate professor in neuroscience at MIT. He heads a unique humanitarian and scientific project, helping people who are born blind later regain their sight and studying them as they do. A rare population in the West, but in India, the rates of children born with cataracts are higher because of infections during pregnancy and lower vaccination rates. 
Absolutely. An ophthalmologist in Italy, Valvo, Alberto Valvo, estimated that fewer than 15 such cases have been studied in any detail over the past millennium. But in India, it turns out that there is still a population of children who are treatably blind. And it was upon discovering this population of children that I decided to launch Project Prakash. And you're working with an extraordinary population of people under the banner of what's called Project Prakash. Prakash That's being right. the Sanskrit word for light, I gather. Tell me about the Indian woman who you've written about most recently. You, you called her by her initials, SRD. We met her in 2003. We were in a clinic in Gujarat, that's a state in Western India, and she had come there to get her daughter checked. Her daughter was born with congenital cataracts. She was about six years old at that time. But we found that the mother herself had a really remarkable history. She had been blind with cataracts until the age of 12 and had then been treated. And at the time we met her, she was 32 years old. So she had had 20 years of post-operative vision. And we decided that this was a really unique opportunity to study how much can the brain learn if given an extended period of time after a really protracted amount of blindness. Because she was essentially, she had the cataracts up until age 12. So there was no visual stimuli or very little for the first 12 years of her life. Is that right? Indeed. Um, So she had light sensitivity, but that was all. So she could tell whether she was in a bright room or a dark room. What did you find surprising in her case? Because you'd assume that she would find it very difficult to, in effect, teach the brain how to see again after that extended period of blindness. Yes, we went in not expecting anything at all. We didn't think she would have any significant visual capabilities. But when we tested her on a whole battery of fairly complex visual tasks, which included things like complex shape matching or visual memory or face recognition, what we found was that her abilities were remarkably well-developed. So that's what surprised us the most, how, quote-unquote, normal uh, she looked, um, even after having had this very long period of blindness. Are there tasks that she didn't do so well at? There are. Uh, So one of the tasks, gaze perception. Even though she could resolve the irises within the eyes, she could tell that, yes, there are these black things in the middle of the sclera, she could not tell what the significance of that was. Right, so if the head was pointed one way but the eyes the other, she couldn't really tell which way they were pointing. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that was one. And the other was visual imagery. If you ask her to imagine a picture, she had a really hard time doing that. The interesting thing about this case and others that you've been working with is... For someone who's been blind for an extended period of time and then regain their sight and seem to pick up the skills of vision, where do these visual skills come from? Are they tapping into an innate visual capacity that we're all born with? Or is it a a learnt process? My hunch would be that it's mostly learnt. There are some aspects of vision that one could call innate, say the sensitivities of the very early visual neurons. But beyond that, making sense of the visual image, attaching meaning to these white blobs or coloured blobs that you're seeing out in the world, Mm. that I'm almost certain is learned. Parwin, have we tended to underestimate the plasticity of the brain, sort of thinking of it as a rather stationary organ with little spurts of plasticity? I think so. Um, I think traditionally we have believed that a lot of the brain is fairly fixed in its ways. And certainly the dogma in neuroscience has been that after the initial few years of life, the brain is pretty set in its ways. No amount of sensory intervention would get it to change its organization. But new studies are suggesting that that view might need to be changed. It's long um, been believed that there's a really critical period in the first few months of life for vision and our visual capacity to develop in the brain, Mm -hmm. um, which really the prognosis then for people born blind hasn't been very good, has it? On what basis was this belief founded? So the human data on this question are fairly sparse. When you do studies of depriving animals like young kittens, as soon as the kitten is born, you put the kitten in a darkened chamber for the first few months of its life. What one finds is that that period of deprivation permanently impairs uh, the kitten on visual tasks. 
for the rest of its life. And that was and Nobel this, Prize winning work, wasn't it? Indeed. Extrapolating from these kinds of results to the human, what we're finding is that that strict interpretation of the critical periods idea is perhaps too strict. It gives a lot of hope, doesn't it, for a huge percentage of the world's population. I mean, 25,000 children approximately are born blind in India each year. In fact, the doctors that we're working with in India tell me that until they started participating in Project Prakash and began seeing evidence of these visual skills, they would not operate on children old, older than four or five years wow. because they thought that it, it would be a pointless exercise. Look, the tragedy of this story uh, is that your subject, SRD, she actually died on the way to taking her daughter to a, a vision clinic recently, didn't she? Just on a purely human level, one of the things that really struck me about SRD when I'd met her was just how many hardships she had overcome. Born into a very poor family, she was blind. She was taking care of her daughter and her husband. Her husband was not making any money at all. I admired the, the resilience of the human spirit. And then to hear that last year uh, she met this accident, it really upset me a lot, a great tragedy. Mm, she was pulled under a bus. I mean, this, yeah, yes. it certainly transforms your relationship to your science, I would imagine. MIT neuroscientist, Associate Professor Parwin Sinha, founder of Project Prakash. Let's climb then back into the experience of what it's like to lose your sight. Nearly 60 years on, psychologist Zoltan Tory, author of The Crucible of Consciousness, remembers it well. You feel like being buried alive. It's, it's, it's ghastly stuff. Deeply claustrophobic. Deeply claustrophobic, yes, and you instinctively try to fight it. When you have sight, the, the visual world pours into, into your retina, into your eyes and into your brain. Whether you want it or not, you just keep your eyelids open. The world gets into you. Interestingly, you've called that a, the sight that most of us possess as a passive immersion in exactly. light. It's almost exactly. a laziness, a lazy exactly. seeing. Yes, because what I have then acquired is active vision. The creative vision where you imagine the world around you and then move it around, do things with it. Artists do that, uh, filmmakers, writers work out visual patterns, models, uh, pictures in their own head and then of course they, they put it out on canvas or whatever. And yet, Zoltan, it's interesting. I mean, as your body healed from the shock and trauma of the acid attack, you were told to let go of the visual, weren't you? It was a very, very terrible idea. I could never accept it. It's like virtually voluntarily getting into your own grave and uh, pulling the lid on top of yourself. It was unacceptable. So instead of that, I tried to immediately visualise where I was who the people were around me and created a virtual world. When I walked along the street, there were virtual cars and virtual driveways and houses and people and faces, and I began to populate it with uh, meaningful context and stories and uh, human faces and voices began to come alive for me. So your mind's so, eye has in effect uh, become a richer internal experience. Oh yes, absolutely. Then you, then you had when you were sighted. Exactly, because of course I didn't need to do this, but I have to do it and I am doing it continuously all the time. H has, the, has the content of that visual world within evolved or has it, does it still draw on the visual triggers that you had before the accident as a young man? The sort of your visual sense of the landscape that you possessed then? It is still using the old material, but of course in constantly new combinations. But what is new, of course, is just the way in which I am able to combine things in my brain without the interference of vision. Normally, when people want to think, they close their eyes because the flood of visual impressions that comes at you is a distraction. Mm. I have the privilege of not having to cope with that of uh, thinking without, I'm um, sort of thinkaholic, if you might use this expression, 
this is the way I did my research work and about psychology and the consciousness and not being troubled with the vision itself. It was possible for me to imagine 